want to say welcome back to the Grove to Chris and Debbie Clark. Can you guys wave, stand real quick? They're in town from Seattle. Chris and Debbie are the founders of Children of the Nations, and we partner with them in Malawi. I grew up with Chris in Africa. He's my Liberian brother. And also, Chris is one of our board members at Justice College. So it's good to have you here, Chris and Debbie, as we talk about Justice College. All right, so earlier this month, we started a new series we've titled The Third Person. And in it, we're looking at the work of the Holy Spirit in and through your life. And today, I want to look at two key words that are used in in Acts chapter 2 to talk about the coming of the Holy Spirit. The words are wind and fire. All right, And when those two words come together, something big, something huge is going to happen. I had my first lesson in fire, in pyrology. I don't know if that's a word, but maybe it is, pyrology, when I was in 11th grade. What happened is, is my family was back from Africa for a few months. My father was speaking on the weekends in churches all over, and They had left me and my twin brother at home alone. And so they gave us some money to buy food for dinner because clearly we were not going to be able to cook. And so on Friday night, we were excited to order pizza. It was the first time we'd ever ordered in pizza, and it was a big night for us. And so we ordered in two larges. And as soon as the pizza got there, we hammered down the first one. And then, you know, we kicked back for an hour or two. Then we got hungry again. And so I picked up the the pizza in the box, and I showed it to my brother, my twin brother. And I said, hey, you know, the pizza came in the box. We need to warm it up. Do you think the whole box goes in the oven with the pizza? And he said, of course it does. You know, the pizza came in the box. They mean for you to warm up in the box. This was our thinking from Africa, all right? We had never warmed up a pizza before. So I turned the oven up to 350 degrees and put the pizza and the box in there. And then we go back to watching Magnum P.I. And, and about 15 minutes later, we smell smoke. And so we run in the kitchen and I see smoke streaming out of the oven. But I think we're still good. I don't see any fire. And, you know, maybe this, this pizza thing is going to be okay. And so I went up and I opened the door. And what do you think? What happened when the air rushed in? It just went up in flames. The whole oven, I mean, the flames are kicking up to the ceiling. I'm thinking we're going to burn the house down. Fortunately, right next to the telephone on the wall, if you're under 25, there was a day when in our houses we had phones attached to the wall. Right next to it was a fire extinguisher. And every 11th grader has needed that good excuse to use a fire extinguisher. So I grabbed the thing, sprayed the fire, put the fire out, ruined the pizza. But that's what happens when fire and air come together. Something big, something happens. Something big happens. So open your Bibles to... Acts chapter 2, we're going to see that kind of explosion happen in the church as the Holy Spirit comes on the scene. I'm going to start in verse 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together, the, the disciples in one place, and suddenly the sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire, so we have wind and we have fire, that were separated and came to rest on each of them, and all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. So we have these two big words, wind and fire. And my, my goal today, my hope today, is to open you your eyes, so to, to wake you up to the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. I've heard it said that, that some say that the Holy Spirit is the most ignored person of the Trinity. Today, I want to wake you up. I hope to wake you up to the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life and the work that the Spirit does through your life. I hope to open your eyes to see that he is everywhere, all around you and in you, just like Katie sing. I, I want to open your eyes. I want to open your ears today to the whispering of the Holy Spirit who is constantly present and speaking to you. I hope to put a fire in your life for Jesus Christ that only the Holy Spirit can do. That's that's what I hope to accomplish today. But it's very possible for us to go to church for years, to be Christians for a long time, and live unaware of the Holy Spirit's presence and work in our lives. We see this happening all through Scripture. If you remember, for example, in Genesis chapter 28, a man named Jacob is is taking this long journey through the desert, and it gets dark on him. And so Jacob finds a rock in the desert and lays down, uses it for a pillow. He had to be pretty stinking tired if he could fall asleep on a rock. 
And when he falls asleep, he sees heaven opened up, doesn't he? He sees a ladder, a stairway, stairway to heaven. And he sees angels coming down and God speaks to him. And when he wakes up, what does he say? He says, God is in this place and I was unaware. Wow. I wonder how many of us go through life that God is in this place. He's with you. His spirit is there in you, with you, working, but you're unaware. I think a lot of us can end up like that. The first word that I want to look at in this text is the word wind or air or breath. They're used synonymously through scripture. In John chapter 20, here's what we read of the disciples. So Jesus, if you want to look at it with me, Jesus has risen from the dead and his followers were hiding. They're afraid. They'd been on the run. And then all of a sudden he shows up. Verse 19, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. As the father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them. How interesting is that? He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So this wind, this breath, this air that Jesus breathes in Scripture always represents life. So the disciples were frozen, immobile, lifeless as followers of Jesus Christ. And he comes in and he breathes life on them. He he breathes the Holy Spirit into them. This is an extremely significant passage, if you think about it. Because until Jesus comes and breathes the Holy Spirit on them, they are immobile, they're stuck, they're frozen, they're doing nothing, they're lifeless. And, And so you see there's an incredibly powerful lesson there. That these early disciples could not do or be anything that God wanted them to be or do until the Holy Spirit was alive in their life. That's a very powerful. If you're writing anything down, write that down. I have this key idea on the screen that I hope sticks with you because it's the same for you and me that you, we, you cannot do or be any of the things that Jesus intends for you to be or do apart from the work of his spirit in your life. I think sometimes we can miss that. We can forget that. So then Jesus says this to them. If you want to go back to our text And in Acts, he says, we read this, this is Acts 1-4. He gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of my Father. Circle the word wait in your Bibles, for which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So he says the Holy Spirit is about to do something big and powerful in this place, but he says wait. Wait. If you think about it anywhere in Scripture where, you, where we read the word wait, what is it always telling us? That God is about to do something big. You just hold on. Something huge is about to happen. My favorite wait line comes from the first page of the Bible. If you want to turn all the way back to Genesis with me. I know all of you in Sunday school, first grade, you memorized Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You have that one down. I, I don't know if everyone knows what, how verse 3 reads. I'll keep reading. Now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering. How interesting is that? The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, and then God said, that, let there be light, and there was light. The Spirit of God was waiting to do something huge. So when Jesus says to the disciples, wait, the Spirit is coming. I want to say it's the same for you and me, that the Spirit of God is hovering over your life, waiting for you to say, come Holy Spirit, and then he starts to work. This prayer That Josh led us in singing a few minutes ago. Come Holy Spirit. This ancient prayer from scripture. Can I invite you to start praying that every day? Come. If you have felt lifeless or distant from God. Spiritually lifeless. Then pray that prayer. Come Holy Spirit. And, and, And in the early church. In this Acts chapter 2. What do we read happens next? We read of the wind and the fire. The Holy Spirit comes. What happens next? It's big. The next thing that happens is is Peter gets up and preaches. 
So Peter, if you remember back just a few days earlier, he was denying knowing Jesus. He was running away. But now he stands up and he preaches this bold sermon. And 3,000 people give their lives to following Jesus Christ. 3,000 from one sermon. And then Christianity starts to spread like wildfire. Not to overuse the metaphor today. But it spreads like fire. It takes off. And, and, and the point here is that the same is with all of our lives. The Spirit of God is waiting to come alive in you. There's a Hebrew word all through the Old Testament that's used to describe what Jesus does to these followers when we read that he breathed the Spirit on them. The Hebrew word is ruach. Maybe you've heard me talk about ruach. Maybe you've read about ruach. Ruach means air, wind, breath, spirit. Ruach most literally or is often used to say the breath of God or the life of God, the life that comes from God, the ruach of God. And we read of this ruach of God all through the Old Testament. And even, and even Jesus, when, uh, when he comes onto the scene and, his, and he starts his ministry in Luke chapter 4, he asks for the ruach of God. So this is one person of the Trinity in his human form. He says, I need the Spirit of God. And what does he say in Luke chapter 4 verse 17? He says, the Spirit of God... The Ruach of God is on me, and he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor and, and, brought me to, and sent me to bring freedom to the prisoners and to lift up the oppressed. But it all starts, he says, with the Ruach of God, the Spirit of God. And so my invitation to you today is to begin to live in the Ruach of God, in the, in the breath, in the life-giving breath of the Spirit of God. I think a lot of Christians focus their spiritual life on sinning less. Now, sinning less is a good thing. So don't leave here and say Palmer said we should sin more. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that. But, but a, lot of, a lot of people can spend their entire Christian lives just trying to sin less. Well, what if instead we focus more on living more and more in the Ruach, in the presence of the Spirit of God? What if we, we spend more of our energy, more of our time living in the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit? Do you see how that becomes life-changing? I think every day, if you think about it, our lives are a string of breaths that we take. We breathe in and we breathe out. When we breathe in, we take in life, oxygen and nitrogen. You can't go long without breathing. You're good for what, four or five minutes, maybe. And then when we breathe out, we exhale the toxins like carbon dioxide. But every day we're breathing, not even thinking much about it, but it's keeping us alive. You breathe about 26,000 times a day. You probably didn't even know that. Not that it matters. We're supposed to breathe from deep in our stomachs, but when we're rushed and anxious, we breathe high, shallow breaths. We should only be breathing four or six times a minute, but when we're worried and afraid and anxious, we breathe like 20 times a minute. Our, the, the breaths that we take, the oxygen that fills our lungs, is meant to give us 99% of our energy. We only use about 10% of that. And so the Hebrew people knew the same thing, that the Ruach of God is there like the air that you breathe. That's why Ruach means breath, air, wind, spirit. The, the, the Ruach of God is there as present as the air that you breathe. And, and every day you live in his presence and you can miss it, you can ignore it, but he's there hovering waiting to give you spiritual life, spiritual passion, a longing for Jesus Christ. But we can miss that. And so that's why I invite you to live in the Ruach, the presence of God. I invite you to pray this prayer more. Come, Holy Spirit. I invite you to wake up tomorrow morning and the first words out of your mouth are, come, Holy Spirit. As you walk into your, your place of work, I invite you to pray, come, Holy Spirit. When you come home from a long, busy day and you're tired and ragged, say, come, Holy Spirit, be present in this place. We can miss that the Ruach of God is there in you, around you, as present as the air that you breathe. Think about it. Like, if you go home this afternoon and you jump in the pool with your kids, or you throw the football with your kids... The Ruach of God, the Spirit of God is there. When you go out to dinner with friends, 
the ruach, the spirit of God is there. When you walk through the cubicles in your workplace, the ruach, the spirit of God is there. That's why I say I hope to wake you up to his spirit there always speaking to you. We can miss that. We can live deaf to the, to the whisperings of the spirit of God. George Bernard Shaw has written a play titled St. Joan. It's about Joan of Arc. And some of the lines he writes, he has one of the characters ask St. Joan, Joan of Arc. The character asks, Joan of Arc, why are you always saying God is speaking to you? Why do you keep saying God that has spoken to you? And she said, because he has. And then she says, he's speaking to you too all the time. It's just that you're not listening. Wow, how many of us go through our days like that? The Ruach of God is present, hovering in us as close as the air that we breathe and we don't listen. The Ruach of God, the Spirit of God is also pressing on your soul to do certain things, to go a certain direction. Have you ever felt that pressing on your heart and your soul? He's telling you not to go somewhere or to go spend time with someone or to go see them or to call them or to forgive them. And then you don't. Has that ever happened? And then it hits you later the next day. Like, why wasn't I listening? I should have been listening. Ignatius of Loyola calls them movements of the soul. When the Ruach of God moves the waters of your soul, you have to listen. And like I said, he's whispering the wisest things, the best things to us. He's, the Spirit of God is whispering things like, forgive him, love her more. And whispering things like, call her, or, or don't go there, or stop that behavior. It's destroying your life. Or take the opportunity, or share with them. Be more generous. I, I say all of that to say... That as we start in this passage, the Spirit of God is alive, present, in you, near you. I just hope to wake you up to that. Begin praying that prayer, come Holy Spirit. In St. Augustine's confessions that he writes towards the end of his life, one of his confessions is, he says that the Holy Spirit, he's been a follower of God his whole life, but he had ignored the work of the Holy Spirit for decades. And so he writes this in his confessions. He writes, our hearts are restless until they rest in you. I have learned to love you late. Wow. I've, how many of us have, have wasted years missing the work of the Holy Spirit? I've learned to love you late. Beauty at once so ancient and so new, I've learned to love you late. You were within me, and I was in the world outside myself. I searched for you outside myself. And disfigured as I was, I fell upon the lovely things of your creation. And he realizes, he says, you were within me, but I was not with you. Do you see why I say pray that prayer more? Come, Holy Spirit. So I said our first word was wind. Our second word that I want to talk about from Acts 2 is fire. All right? So let's go back to our text, Acts 2, verse 42. Not 42. Verse, uh, I'll start in verse 3. And we read this. Suddenly the sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. So this second word that is used not just in this text, but all through the Bible to talk about the presence of God, the Spirit of God, is this word fire. I love how today when someone does something amazing, what do we say? We say fire, right? And and, and if you're texting someone and they've done something incredible, you you don't just say fire. You put the fire emoji. That's that's my favorite emoji right now, the fire. Fire. Like for example, for example, I hate to admit this in Arizona, but I'm a Dodger fan. I know there's D-back fans. That's okay. Uh, next year will be your year. Um, but anyway, so I'm watching the Dodgers, and if you saw them Wednesday night, anyone see them Wednesday night first inning? All you need to watch was the first inning. They scored 11 runs in the first inning. What is that? One word. Fire. That's fire. All right. The next day, though, the next day, though, the flame went out. All right. They completely. There's a giant wind literally whipping through that stadium in Texas. And 
They, got, they lost miserably. But today, today we're playing game seven, so you can, uh, you can catch up on that soon. Anyway, fire. It, it, when, when there's a fire, if you're building a fire with your kids, what do you want? You want a big, giant bonfire, right? So, for example, my son was graduating from college in August from Point Loma in San Diego. And so our whole family was out there. His graduation was COVID graduation, kind of spaced out, was in, was in the afternoon. So I was trying to come up with a plan for what we could do that night. And I was walking down the street near our VRBO in our Airbnb in, in, in Mission Beach. And I see a guy with his garage open and it's full of firewood, and he's loading more firewood in. So I had to stop. I said, dude, what are you doing with all this firewood? And he said, I'm the fireman of Mission Beach. I said, oh. I said, what do you do? He said, I have a business. He said, I light fires for people. So if people want a bonfire on the beach, you want tiki torches, I, I bring the fire. I was like, wow. Okay. I said, are you free Friday night? And he was. So I hired him on the spot. I said, I need a fire. I said, I need a big one. He said, okay. So I paid his contracted price, and I'm picturing, you know, this big bonfire. It's going to be amazing, like singe our eyebrows. And this was a fire. It was a great fire, <laughs> just, not, just not as big as I was hoping for. Now, he's an awesome dude because I called. This was before sunset. It's just getting dark. I called. I said, hey, man, we need more wood. He said, oh, that'll last till 10 o'clock. I said, no, no, I'm from Africa. I know how fires burn. I bring me more. And he brought more wood. So, so it got bigger. It got bigger as the night went on. But, but the point is, if you're going to have a fire, you need it to be big. And when the Bible talks about the presence of the Holy Spirit, it uses this word fire because something important, something big is happening. From the opening pages of the Bible, the scripture writers use fire, and God, God shows himself as fire. And when you look at Genesis 15, for example, Abraham sees God coming from a fire pot, the smoke of a fire pot. And then, of course, the people of Israel, as they're traveling through the desert at night, Jesus, or God is seen in the form of fire in the sky. And then we all know the story of Moses who's walking through the desert and he sees this burning or he's herding sheep and he sees this burning bush that is not consumed by the fire. But this is a very interesting thing because when he stops to look at the fire, God speaks. And the first thing that God says is, the ground is holy. The ground is holy. God is present. So Moses drops to the ground and he takes off his shoes and it's an interesting thing because think about it. Moses has probably walked by this bush. He's been in that same desert region for decades. He's walked by that same bush a thousand times. And he's missed the presence of God. And I think you and I can end up living the same way. God is present. The ground is holy. And we miss it. That's why I say I want to wake you up to the presence of the Spirit of God in your life every day. We walk past the burning bush of Moses all the time, and we miss that God is here, as present, as I said earlier, as the air that we breathe. We stand on holy ground all the time. The Spirit of God is in you. That's why, that, that, that's why God says, be holy as I am holy, because you can. The Spirit of God is in you. In Luke chapter 3, John the Baptist uses the most interesting language to talk about the Holy Spirit coming. He says this. So people are asking John the Baptist. This is, John, this is Luke chapter 3. He, uh, are asking, are you the Messiah? And he says, no, I'm not. He said, I baptize with water. But one who is more powerful than I will come. The straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. How do you like that? He said he's going to baptize you with a Holy Spirit and fire. When John the Baptist is on the scene, when Jesus arrives, though, the people had, uh, uh, the Jewish people had lost their fire. Their flame had gone out. The people of Israel had become, their, for them following God, had become ritualistic, legalistic. They become separatists, haters of people of other races and nationality. They were dispassionate about God. They were spiritually dead. And then John the Baptist says, hang on. He is coming to bring the Holy Spirit and fire. 
That, that's why, because of the deadness of the Jewish people, is why Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, he says, wake up, you sleeper. The Holy Spirit is coming to wake people up. I think it still happens today. What happened to the Jewish people 2,000 years ago, it can still happen. People can show up at church. They can read their Bibles, but they can be dead to the Spirit of God working in them and leading them and guiding them to the beautiful life that God has for us. We can miss it. There's a story that Andrew Arnett shares. Andrew Arnett is a pastor and a writer, and he shares a story in his new book titled All Flame. He shares a story from the Desert Fathers. He says it's a story the Desert Fathers used to tell. And the Desert Fathers would talk about two old Jewish men. One is, they said his name is Abba Lot. The other one is Abba Joseph. And they said that Abba Joseph and Abba Lot are having this conversation about their spiritual lives. And Abba Lot says, hey, Abba Joseph, I'm, I'm doing the best I can. He said, I sit in my office, in my little office, and he, say, he said, I, I say a little prayer. And then I read the Bible a little. He said, I fast a little. And then I try to stay as holy as possible. He says, but what else can I do? You know, that's, that's as much as I can do, isn't it? That's as hard as I'm trying my best. And with that, the Desert Fathers say that his friend Abba Joseph stands up. And his answer to Abelot is he raises his hands like this to heaven. And, and as he lifts his hands, his ten fingers become like ten flames toward heaven. And as he holds up his hands like ten flames towards heaven, he says to his friend, he says, he says, Abelot, he said, if you will, if you will, this is up to you, if you will, you can be all flame too. You know, you're settling for this little life in your office, this little spiritual life after God, but you can be all flame to. And I say that just to say the same thing to you, that you can be all fire for Jesus Christ. You can be filled with the passion and the power of the Holy Spirit if you will, if you come awake alive to the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. You see, when the Spirit comes into our lives, it sets our lives on fire for Jesus Christ. I think there's some people that see the life of following God as being certain activities that we do, like, like Abba Lot did. Activities like reading the Bible, uh, saying prayers, singing songs. Those are all good things. Having our quiet time, those are all good things. But we can miss the life filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, the life filled with the Holy Spirit is a life that is burning with a desire for holiness. The life filled with the Holy Spirit is a life that is burning with a love for all people. The life filled with the Holy Spirit is a, it is a life burning with a hunger for God's Word. The life filled with the Holy Spirit is a life burning with a passion for justice, a passion to lift up all people who are oppressed. This fire that the Holy Spirit puts in us, it burns up. It has a way of burning up our sinful desires. It burns up our longings for lesser things, for pleasure and leisure. It burns up our idols that we've created. It burns up our addictive habits. It can do that. This fire of the Holy Spirit ignites in our soul a love for people that we can't find anywhere else. This, this fire of the Holy Spirit ignites a love for people making you and me people of peace, people of blessing, others preferring, everyone embracing, people who are utterly humble, always generous, always wise, compassionate, and loving like Christ has called.